Hello and welcome to our new podcast where experts from across IMCD will be guiding listeners through a series of trending topics in the ever evolving specialty chemicals and ingredients industry and all of its end markets. I'm Gary Turner and I'm from IMCD in the UK. I'm really pleased to be joined by three of my global colleagues to kickstart the discussion by diving into the world of food and nutrition. Can I ask each of you to introduce yourselves, starting with you, Fergus, please. Hi, thanks, Gary. Um, I'm Fergus Johnson. I'm the Business Group Director for MIEF um, for our food and nutrition team. I'm glad to join you on this podcast today. Fantastic. And also, Yeni, great to see you today. Yeah, great to see you too, Gary. I'll introduce myself. My name is Yeni Widya. I'm the uh, Business Director for the Food and Nutrition Business in IMCD Indonesia. Fantastic. And hi, and last but not least, Devin, uh, t- tell us a little bit more about your role. Hi, Gary. Thank you very much. My name is Devin Chan. I'm the Vice President of Food and Nutrition for the Americas, and I've been with the organization for about 24 years. Wow. We're going to come back to that one, Devin. Um, what a, as we frame today's conversation for you that have kindly joined us today, um, we're here today following the launch of a new series of trends commentaries, where technical and commercial experts from across IMCD share insights on the future of the markets where our business groups are most active. The first commentary to be published is by our food and nutrition team, and it's titled Tomorrow's Menu, where we explore how the rise of the more conscious and curious consumer is creating opportunities to develop products that have no or less sugar, no meat, and so on, all while still being enjoyable to eat. So before we get into the conversation today, let me share a few of the key insights that we've been learning. And one of those is that globally, 74% of consumers have taken proactive steps to improve their health and wellness over the past year. Also, yet for many of us, it's a balancing act, a really difficult balancing act to maintain a healthy lifestyle while juggling work, family, and a social life. So people are really on the lookout for convenient ways to fit more optimal nutrition into their busy schedules. And so we're seeing ingredients like dietary fibres and plant-based proteins on the rise in popularity. And what I'd love to do is really start diving into this conversation. So Fergus, if I can come to you first of all, what are the main health priorities of consumers in your region? And what kind of food and nutrition products are they looking for to try and support these goals? Hi, Gary. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Very interesting topic. Um, health and food and I think um, consumers really understand the link between the two um, and it's better understood and and consumers really want to uh, learn more about it. Um, I think we've gone from the days of fat being bad and um, proteins being good to a much more um, better understanding of uh, nutrition and balance and for us here in Europe it's really about that balance and about Nutriscore. Um, This is the traffic light system that's come in to help um, consumers in a confusing uh, labelling environment understand um, healthy food. Um, I think also with the COVID um, epidemic, I think also immunity has become very topical and people are really looking at any way in which they can protect themselves in this um, horrible situation we find ourselves. That's really, really interesting. Um, Yeni, I'd love to come to you if I may. Like that's, there's also a risk of information overload to some extent. We've got all of this information flying at us. How do people in your region make sense of all of these options that we have with regards to foods and nutrition now? Yeah, um, this is uh, for Indonesia, actually, um, food and nutrition has always been a very hot topic of uh, regulation um, because uh, we are nations who love to enjoy foods. Uh, we, we love to eat. Um, and uh, there's not a lot of uh, uh, understanding, I would say, uh, on the, let's say, on the use of fats and what does it mean to be uh, what's the le- right level of sugar um, but uh, the regulators actually now has been working on creating a new uh, method of um, a traffic light um, but although it's not out yet um, but uh, they will start with uh, sugar so they will have some kind of a healthy choice logo uh, for products that meet their criteria. Um, so, and this is uh, what they are going to do, uh, and they will do more on uh, not only sugars, uh, but they will also follow with fats and sodium content uh, in Indonesia. That's really interesting. So straight away, we've got this really clear sense of sort of a mix of commercial and regulation working in partnership to bring this more healthy way of being to life. And I'm wondering, Devin, is that the same over in the Americas as well? Are you seeing this traffic light system or something different? Well, I think the the whole theme around personalized nutrition is quite prominent these days. And uh, when you talk about personalized nutrition, it's 
what's good for the individual, what's good for me is not necessarily what's good for somebody else. And that can segue into things like your physical well-being. It could be weight loss. It could be uh, you know just nutrition balance. It could be energy lifting, satiety, um, or it could also segue into your mental well-being. Uh, right now, with people staying at home, you know, you're cooped up and you're you're anxious. You're lonely. Maybe uh, there are foods that can make you feel good uh, just by little indulgences that people want to sneak away with. So. Uh, here, I think in, in North America, we, we definitely see the uh, consumer is king. You know, there's lots of choice. And uh, with that, uh, a lot of the brands now are trying to cater towards certain demographics that may have a preference for one of these uh, attributes. It's really interesting. What I also heard when Fergus just shared was around this topic of immunity, Devin. And is that a key part of personalization of, of food and nutrition, that immunity? Is that like a core tenant almost? Yeah, I, I think right now, certainly with uh, people always worried about their health, uh, there's Im immunity is top of mind. So, you know, we think about immunity, you think about vitamins, uh, supplements that can uh, help boost your immunity overall. But that, that, that does go into foods quite easily. Uh, gut health is, uh, is a major theme these days. So uh, prebiotic fibers, uh, probiotics, all things that are used to uh, increase your digestibility are, are key components of foods today. Um, other things that we look at uh, definitely right now is the whole movement around protein. Uh, protein is now king. Everybody wants to look at different ways of boosting their protein intake and the plant-based movement is certainly here to stay. It's really interesting. Like I seriously love these vegan burgers. Like I'm the most biggest ready meter. Uh, ready meter. I was just like, my God, this actually tastes as good, if not better, than some of the, the, the meat. Like I genuinely found I enjoyed the taste more of some of the right. vegan options. Are you finding that that is a very real trend? Like, is, is that, are we seeing that, for example, Yeni, in Asia? Are you seeing, I know, is there a lot of sort of move towards plant-based, or is it actually quite an already well-established approach to food and nutrition in Asia? Uh, yeah, actually, the term plant-based is probably uh, very European, I would say. Um, in Indonesia, uh, the, the plant-based diet has always uh, been the, the roots of the common people's diet. Uh, for example, uh, if you know uh, tempeh, uh, tofu, um, and uh, rice, you know, these are the basic proteins that people, majority of people take. Uh, they take these two, tofu, tempeh and um, sambal you know if you know like a chili paste and they have a good meal already um, this uh, I think uh, plant based here is really not uh, I wouldn't say it's a movement uh, but uh, there's certainly opportunities uh, with the advancement in science and technology food science and technology that uh, uh, people are able to use the more commonly used soy base or uh, maybe more the Western like pea, um, but they, 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 they are able to process it so that uh, it becomes more interesting format in the packaged food. So they don't have to be in the, you know, the maybe old fashioned tofu, fried tofu or anymore, but it can be a really nice um, uh, a drinkable uh, uh, yogurt uh, that is maybe soy based or uh, oat based. Uh, these are, um, some of the opportunities for the adventurous consumers to have a, a, a variety in their food choices. Um, but I wouldn't say it's, it's a movement, but because it's always, been, um, it's always been there, I would say, but it's just taking a, a nicer format of food packaging. That's so interesting. Fergus, what, what about in, in Europe? Um, how are you finding sort of vegan and these sort of meat alternatives? Is it something that's on the rise in terms of a this is a This is a huge trend for us, again, on, in the health space where people are trying to have these balanced um, diets. And I think plant protein, for example, gives a perfect opportunity to have uh, all the benefits of protein, but maybe without the, uh, the fat in it that comes with the meat side. So, yeah, I think as, as a general move in plant protein is also sustainability. It's a, a much greener way of consuming protein. Uh, and I think people are getting very used to the taste. Like you said, the, uh, the technology moves on every day. And um, these, these really do taste like burgers. They are really good and healthy um, and right for us. So I think it's, um, yeah, it's a huge trend for us here in, uh, in, in the scope to get a balanced diet. In, what, how does sort of branding play a role in food and nutrition? Are you seeing that, Devin, in terms of the Americas? Is, 
is branding a key part of these these developments in, in food and nutrition? Well, a lot of the brands are are staples. So uh, you see the the more mature brands that are out there uh, are the ones that are catching up because you have innovation that happens quite regularly through startup companies and uh, companies that are trying to find a niche and then those niches explode. So we talked about the the meat alternative market that really started with trying to find ways to replace beef in something as simple as a hamburger. And as you know, North America is the home of the hamburger. So uh, as you look at ways to replace that meat, um, you can look at vegetable proteins as uh, a key product that could function and provide the same uh, nutritional benefits, the same PDCAS in some cases, uh, to mimic meat. And uh, with that, though, there are formulating challenges, as you mentioned before. It, it tastes like a hamburger, but uh, uh, because you can add savory components into that product to uh, uh, help to, to, to taste like a hamburger, but it's also the texture. And you have to find ways to uh, have that bite feel like meat uh, when, you are, when you're actually eating that product. So uh, formulating needs right now are continuing to evolve. Uh, one thing that you mentioned earlier is that they are nutritious, but in order to get that meat alternative, you do have to add it a lot of sodium and a lot of fat that uh, now I think the movement is towards making those products more nutritious as well. Great. I'm just I'm really interested, um, Yenny, in the Asian um, food nutrition market right now. How has this year's pandemic impacted buying habits? Are you seeing any sort of, are any of these trends been accelerated, for example, because more people are at home? Or give us a bit of a sense as to how the, how the pandemic's impacted the Asian food and nutrition market. Uh, yeah, I think in the pandemic, uh, things have changed a lot since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, uh, earlier in the year when the pandemic started, people uh, certainly um, were on panic buying. Uh, and then the, the, the supplements uh, like vitamin C, uh, they're, um, they triple the price and, and everybody's trying to get uh, their supply in the house. Um, including myself actually i had to buy a few packs you know just enough for everyone and also my neighbors <laughs> because it's not about myself right uh the people around us also impacted um uh, the, the 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 behavior or the trends has somewhat and uh, now become uh more normalized i would say uh, uh people are not looking for supplements anymore you know in the form of tablets or capsules but they they look into their everyday food to give them what they need uh, not only the nutritious uh, components, um, such as you know, good for their gut health, uh, for their digestion, uh, but also what's quite important now is the the, the nostalgia component of the food. Uh, so we see uh, nowadays when when the uh, traditional business owners like restaurants, they had to you know think about ways to save their business. Uh, what they have uh, proven successful, and um, it's actually in the newspaper, um, are uh, these, um, uh, what you call that, um, a service to get the food uh, from a particular region, uh, in within, still within the country, uh, for easier transport, uh, to another part of the region. So, you know, if you're missing the Bali food, uh, a certain type of food in Bali, there are actually businesses who does, uh, you know, um, uh, they they consolidate from the several restaurants in the Bali area, uh, and they bring into uh, other country, uh, other cities. Uh, you know, in Jakarta, the big cities, Surabaya, where uh, many of the visitors normally come to Bali uh, to have vacation, to have holiday. Um, so uh, this is now what's uh, what's on trend. Uh, we see that uh, uh, a nostalgic uh, or or an a different way of experience food because people have been tired in, under lockdown uh, so there's a lot of like other uh, other countries flavor other countries style like New York style uh, has been uh, you know uh, new stores in Indonesia on New York style pizza uh, probably people never been to New York now they can taste the New York style pizza in Indonesia you know uh, so this this is what uh, the pandemic I think is uh, giving uh, or forcing us to be more creative and to listen to the, the needs of our con consumers. And I think people want to feel good about what they're eating. So you, you have these uh, 
beauty from within concepts. Uh, when you people look at the labels all the time and look at what's actually in these products, and uh, you're you're kind of right, Yanni. You you have this uh, nostalgic feel that people want to revert back to because it's comforting. And uh, at the same time, too, uh, although it's comforting, the opportunity for brands today and and manufacturers is to create things that provide that comfort and that nostalgia, but also provide some sort of nutritional benefit. And uh, that's something that we've seen come across many of the innovative companies we have here in North America. Yeah, I think that's very similar in Europe. I think it's um, almost two trends converging, really. It's a, it's a challenge for the consumer because on one hand, they're, um, they're only real, during the pandemic, they're only real um, able to enjoy themselves through indulgence and food, yet there's quite a big pre- pressure on being healthy because of uh, the links with obesity and COVID. So people on one hand are trying to be healthy and eat well, and on the other hand, are kind of using food as their, um, as their way of enjoying life and, um, and getting out a bit and uh, experiencing new things. So I think it's a real challenge for the consumer. Yeah, the other thing that I, I see here is that the, the, the whole idea around convenience, um, that was always a, a main driver for brands across uh, our, our landscape here in North America. Now that people are staying at home, I, I don't know how much convenience matters. Um, I think it is more about what's in the product that we're consuming. So, um, you know, with the pandemic still among us today, one thing that's quite noticeable are the closures and lockdowns that are happening with the gyms and the fitness centers and uh, the impact to our customer base there has been visible. Uh, what I think is happening is that people are now, instead of buying that, uh, that Fortify product at, on the store shelf that's very convenient, they're trying to make that at home, uh, be it a, a, a natural smoothie that they can take and, uh, and, and supplement their, their workout. So I, I think there's ways that people are adapting uh, given the current environment and w- definitely nutrition is top of mind, but comfort foods and, uh, you know, same time being nutritious and uh, healthy are always top of mind. Yeah, I think um, definitely convenience is taking a back step. Um, I've even been more in the kitchen with my children baking and things um, during this period. So uh, <laughs> I think you're right. I think people are, again, using that time they've got at home to, uh, to cook again. It's nice to get back to those, um, those old um, habits. Is there something, I'm really interested listening to the three of you talk. You know, I've heard about this clean label phrase in the food and nutrition arena, and it's not something I particularly know well. And I was, I was wondering, would you mind explaining a bit more about that, Yeni, for us, this, this clean label? And is, is it a trend in the, in the Asian region? Um, I think, uh, first of all, I think the clean label definition, uh, there are some differences in um, maybe for different countries. Um, for for Indonesia, uh, when we call when we talk about clean label, normally it's all about the E numbers. Uh, but for Indonesia, actually, it's not relevant. Uh, for example, uh, regulators now state like emulsifiers and stabilizers, they do not need to be labeled as the chemical name or having E number, uh, but they can be categorized as the expected functions. For example, um, you know, we take like acetylated dye starch adipate can be labeled as a uh, vegetable stabilizers. Uh, so that sounds clean label to, you know, to, to many of the readers of the uh, packaged food readers because they're vegetable and then it stabilizes its thing. So why not? Right. Uh, it's nothing wrong with that. Um, so, I mean, that is as, as of now, um, there, there have been discussion whether, you know, uh, eventually they will require the name, uh, the chemical name of the ingredients. When that happens, I think the landscape is going to, ch- to, to change again uh, in here. Um, but I, I think uh, what we can agree on about clean label is actually the perceived naturalness of the product. Um, and uh, this is what consumers look for. They look for the brand uh, or food uh, that can give them uh, the, the, the feeling of that they are consuming something natural. Perhaps they can uh, create this in the uh, in the packaging, um, you know, with the pictures of the vegetables or fruits, uh, and then they can do this in the brand story as well. Uh, but um, I would say that um, it cannot be, you know, just on the packaging. Uh, they have, um, I think, honesty is actually is one thing about being a clean label is clear labeling also shorter and more uh, to the point uh, for example instead of pbhq is rosemary extract uh, that can give uh, a better 
you know feeling uh, and and a sense of more premium natural products and the consumers are willing to pay more for this I, I think the clean label actually implies healthy and that's what I, I think is a, a clear implication there but what the movement around clean label to me really means is transparency uh, what are we consuming in those products and do I understand what those ingredients are so you know you see a lot of packaging you mentioned that earlier Yeni where the packaging might say something like nitrate free uh, because the implication is that nitrates are bad for you um, so you know you, you got to be careful with how these things are being uh, conveyed in, in the media uh, obviously I think science is everything and uh, when it comes to a clean label you can still achieve a lot of great tasting foods that are nutritious without having really long label decks on, on the back of the package. Sure, I think um, I think that you're right, Devin. The, the sort of clean label, clear label, or kitchen cupboard labeling, I think it's all very confusing for the consumer. But at the end of the day, they just want sort of simple, unprocessed food that's good for them. And so I think that's um, sort of wrapped up, and I think it means different things to different people. And um, I think our job, a part of our job in the industry is to make sure that we can help people uh, achieve those great products still, but have um, appealing labels and, uh, and appealing um, products. I find it really interesting that some of the words that came up there around trust and transparency. Yeah, I think it's really, really interesting. There's this very sort of human lens on the industry. You know, how do we make it easy and frictionless almost for, for consumers to buy? But buy with confidence. Is, does that sound fair, Fergus, or do you challenge or build on that? No, I think I think you're right, and I think there have been certain stories in the media and the press and things about um, food scares and those kind of things. Um, and I think consumers are just much better educated now. They understand food um, better. I still think things like clean label, clear label. I mean, vitamin C is an E number, and yet we're saying um, let's have E number free products. What you want to remove the vitamin C from the product? I mean, there's some things in there that are a bit strange, but again, it's a bit of a fad and a bit of a trend. I think in that um, in that sense. People really just want to eat healthily uh, and eat well, but uh, definitely the transparency and trust is a key element of that. They want to understand what's in their food. W why does their chicken have like six other ingredients in it? They thought they were just buying chicken. So definitely transparency is, um, is there. So, and how, how does that show up for you, uh, Devin, around this sort of trust and transparency lens? Is that, is that something that's really showing up in, in the Americas? Uh, I think it's a given, right? Do people need to have that as the starting point. When you have uh, a transparent or clear label or um, being ethical about how you are making product, uh, the, the consumer expects you to have quality standards and a clean label is just one way of, of conveying that. So uh, it, it's, I don't think it's a, a fad or a trend here. I think it's a movement overall and it's here to stay. Um, we've seen a lot of... Uh, natural products that are now able to function to replace some of those longer chemically sounding labels and uh, across North America as, as Fergus said right now it, it is uh, something that's expected people want to know what they're eating. I think it's much more for me it's much more part of a bigger uh, movement around health I think um, it's just a subset of that um, that same criteria. That um, clean label is just an easy way to explain to people, or an easy way for the industry to get hold of. But I think the roots of that um, trend are much more in in healthy eating or simple eating or um, that kind of thing. So I wonder whether clean label will survive um, too much longer. But I think the, the the growth will come through from um, from the actual naturalness um, or those tr those bigger trends in health. I'm really interested across the three of you, if I may ask. Like, it, it seems to me, listening to your talk, that it's, it's almost like a back-to-nature type story. You've got the sort of Americas and Europe sort of almost looking back east a little bit to like sort of natural. It's sort of, it's, that's sort of how it feels. Is, is that correct? Is, can you build on that or challenge that, Yeni? I wonder what your, what your thoughts are. Yeah, um, I think uh, about that transparency and honesty. And uh, it's really what, what people are looking for. And... Uh, nowadays, brands they give a um, they uh, it's almost a given that they have a social media next to it uh, so that people can go into uh, what they eat and and you know have more than what the package can hold uh, in terms of the stories uh, and and here's another where people also want to have a, a, an impact you know with with the with the social media. Uh, almost as uh, as going side by side with a brand uh it it can give uh, uh, another message that okay by by doing this you are uh helping 
the the farmers for example uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, new uh, food coming um, emerging in Indonesia that uh, has an origin you know where this is grown in this region in in uh, in Lombok you know or uh, helping the farmers of uh, spinach farmers in certain area uh, and this kind of message actually it, it helps to to give a sense of honesty transparency to consumers who eat and then the 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 sense that they are part of a bigger picture by by consuming the foods this this is such a significant point for me and as, as we start to wrap up today's amazing conversation i'm really interested in the impact of the younger generations on this whole movement they've got a lot more information as you say we've got this labeling trend we've got more information out there and we've got this, this younger generation that basically are a lot more challenging they expect better how's that showing up for you fergus in the european market is that, would you confirm deny or challenge that yeah, no, I think that's a, a great point. And I think um, uh, the, the young consumers of today are the best educated consumers we've had. They understand food better than any of the generations before. Uh, and they make very strong choices. And um, I think it's also um, a bit of a sense where they want their cake and eat it. They want really indulgent, really great tasting, um, adventurous food. But by the way, it has to be healthy. It can't have this much fat and it. it must have high protein. So I think for the manufacturing industry, it's a real challenge to meet those um, very demanding um, new consumers that are coming through. I think also they have um, more money than um, previous um, times and they want to experiment and they want to try new things. So it's, uh, it's a really interesting time for the food industry to meet, meet those um, challenging consumers' demands. They're highly influenced by social media too. So when you're looking at... Uh how these food trends are emerging. It, it could be as simple as uh, something posted on, on social media that people start grabbing onto and it goes viral. So I, I agree with you, Fergus, that that demographic is much more ed educated than uh, I was, I guess, going, <laughs> growing up um, and looking at what I'm eating. And uh, they're also a little bit more adventurous too. They, they want to try different things because maybe they haven't experienced uh, traveling to the extent that they would like to at that stage in their life. Um, but I think demographics in general play a big pl they play a big part with uh, manufacturers of ingredients and also with uh, brand owners uh, to really understand your target market. It's, it's yeah. so interesting. It's so interesting to me this because we've got this sustainability message, we've got this informed consumer message. And I'm just wondering, again, is we, what, what's coming up for you around this? This sort of more it seems to me to be a more holistic view of food and nutrition going forward. Is that, is that true or, or would you add or challenge that? Well, um, in, in my view right now, it's uh, foods are relatable, right? Uh, so when you talk, you, your previous question about uh, Europe and North America kind of reverting back or looking at Asia on things that are more traditional, I, I think that plays true, but you can achieve that different ways. Um, people still want to have uh, convenience at times. They would still want to have nutrition at times but you can get that through flavors, for example, where um, different flavors and spices might be coming from the Orient that uh, have not been here before. And uh, that, that adventurous consumer, which I think we're gonna talk about a bit later on, is something that uh, is a target market and, and uh, brands are trying to find ways to, to, to get new uh, products to that demographic. How about for you, Yanni, in, in Asia? Is this, this sort of younger, more informed consumer, is it, is it really driving change within, within the Asian food and nutrition market? Uh, yeah, um, I have a kid myself and they are, uh, they are so influenced by um, the cartoon characters on what they want. They're like, no, don't pick that one, you know, but they're so pink, mommy, you know, I want it. Uh, yeah, they're... they're um, actually a, can be a decision owner and uh, a and decision uh, maker as well on how or what to select uh, to buy in a household. Um, and they, they are very um, uh, savvy in, in a digital world. So, um, you know, and, and the, the, the role of influencers now, uh, especially under the lockdown where, you know, people, they spend more time online uh, you know, browsing to through Instagrams or watching. Um, I cannot. Can I call it about Netflix? <laughs> I okay. I'm not endorsed here. <laughs> uh, and and uh, 
for example, uh, the Korean, uh, the, the influence of Korean drama is very phenomenal in Indonesia, you know. Uh, so people uh, um, would love to uh, try uh, their foods, uh, like for example, fried chicken, uh, Korean style, um, as well as, you know, uh, uh, instant noodle, Korean style, um, anything. Um, and then these kids, they, they, they can order anything pretty much at the palm of their hands, you know, just click uh, and then it gets delivered. So yes, uh, the, the, uh, the role of a younger generations uh, I think with the technology now, uh, it goes back to the personalization, you know, uh, there, there's, uh, I guess it's always good or available market for any needs now uh, more than ever. Fantastic. Well, look, thank you so much to Yenny, Fergus and Devin for joining us today. We've got another couple of these episodes coming up, which is really exciting. So thank you, the listener, for joining us today. We hope you found the discussion interesting and insightful. This podcast is part of a calendar of activities launched to mark IMCD's 25th anniversary, a major milestone for us as we celebrate over two decades of innovation and value creation. If you want to read more about our latest trends in food and nutrition, you can download a copy of the full trends commentary on our website, where you can also watch out for our next podcast, New Food Adventures. If you'd like to get in touch to discuss any topics from today's episode, you can contact us at podcast at imcdgroup.com. That's podcast at imcdgroup, one word, dot com. Thank you so much for joining us today and see you on the next conversation. Thanks, Gary. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.